Yeah, so thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Uh, I think I got introduced by Kevin, but I'll let each one of the panelists introduce himself briefly and then we can start. Sure, I'm Steve McKeon. I'm a finance professor at University of Oregon uh, and a partner at Collaborative Fund. Hi, my name is Jill Carlson. I've consulted and advised with many startups in the crypto space. And prior to that, I was working on Wall Street as a trader. Hey, I'm Parker Thompson. I am a seed investor with a background in technology and distributed systems. I'm Joshua Stein. I'm the CEO of Harbor. Harbor is a software platform for security token issuance and an Ethereum protocol to control uh, from a compliance standpoint how it trades in the secondary markets. Thank you very much. So I think security tokens has been the hottest topic of the year. Uh, we see a lot of platform coming up. Uh, maybe for the audience here, uh, what is a security token in your perspective? What characteristic does it have? What is it, how is it similar, different from traditional securities? Maybe you can kind of give us an overview in your perspective. You want to start? Sure. So at the highest level, I'd say um, security tokens are um, tradable ownership claims where the record of ownership is maintained on a blockchain. And so that would include both um, transitory securities, uh, like network assets that hope to be deemed uh, something other than securities, but perhaps are securities early on, uh, pre-launch. And then, of course, it also includes what some people would say is even a larger category of traditional assets, which could be further broken down into uh, real estate, uh, private equity, uh, and, and all those sorts of uh, claims such as fixed income. Yeah, to answer this question, I want to go back in time a little bit. And firstly, we have to cover what is a security. It's a stock or a bond in general, right? Now, when stocks and bonds were first being traded, uh, not too long ago, actually, within the last hundred years, the form factor of them was paper, right? They were actual physical stock or bond certificates that could be moved around. In fact, there were trucks that would deliver them from bank to bank all around Wall Street and lower Manhattan that would physically deliver. Over time, with new technology, we obviously grew out of that. And we now have uh, databases and electronic versions of them that are kept on record at a company called the DTCC. And the DTCC maintains a centralized database of ownership of all of these stocks and bonds. So no, no more physical certificates. The DTCC kind of runs that show. So if you ask me what is a security token, it's no different from the stocks and bonds that you know, Wall Street has been trading again, going back to 100 years ago, it's just that the form factor of them might again be changing. And specifically what that looks like is changing away from the central securities depository model, the DTCC, and into something that again looks like a bearer asset, much more like what it looked like 100 years ago, but this time in electronic form. So no more physical certificates, but rather digital certificates. So I just think there's a couple things in there, though, that we want to unpack, and we're conflating a few things. One is, is um, private capital formation or private securities from public ones. So, Joe, when you talk about DDTC, that's exactly right for public companies. Um, you may be familiar with what was called the Dole Foods case from a couple years ago. DDTC is a centralized repository where they keep all the records. Broker-dealers have accounts in DDTC, then sub-broker-dealer accounts, and then client accounts. And so Dole Foods was public going private. They thought they had 34 million shares outstanding. Investors thought they had 46 million shares outstanding. And the Delaware Chancery Court kind of threw their hands up in the air and said it's too complicated for us to figure out. Blockchain applied to that is exactly what you're talking about. It's a transference from um, one electronic database that today is highly centralized, that has multiple ledgers kept by multiple parties, to one ledger kept by all parties. It's very different for private capital formation. Today, those are not digitized. There is no central repository. The way those are tracked is by pieces of paper stuck in the desk drawer of um, attorneys and at law firms. It's kept on Excel spreadsheets, kept by law firms. So a lot of the tech companies in the Valley, they have their cap table on Excel spreadsheet. It's always screwed up. They never are quite sure. And every time they go through a fundraising, they got to clean it all up. And so I think when you think of private securities, you're actually skipping over that intermediate technological step of a centralized database. You're going directly to a decentralized ledger to take in that Excel spreadsheet that today exists 
in millions of different law firms and putting it all up in the great Excel spreadsheet in the sky we call Ethereum. Um, and it's going to unlock a lot of the advantages in the public markets and bring, bring it to private markets. I guess what I would add to this is I think there's a fundamental question here when we're talking about what is a security with respect to blockchain, which is, um, is it this token? Is it the ownership tied to this private key? Or is it a legal concept that we may or may not choose to map to some database that is distributed, right? Um, I think that's where, you know, you've really got to follow through and say, like, well, okay, well, what happens if I steal your private key? Do I own the security? This is a real question, right? Um, and how do we architect technology that's going to support the legal concepts, or do we believe that the law is just going to change to support this bearer bond concepts? I think that's an interesting... Um, you, you have to take a position on that to think about uh, securities on the blockchain. And yeah, sorry, Jill. And I want to add another thing. I mean, that's the kind of next step. Is like why blockchain? And you, and you pretty much said this is the reason we need a blockchain because it's paperless, paper-based procedures. But can we just digitize it in a centralized way? Like, why do we need a blockchain for that? So you we already have digital cap table management, right? Uh, not in the same fashion. So to really get uh, the advantages of the public markets, i.e., liquidity. And to bring that to the private markets, it requires something like the blockchain. Um, let me give you an analogy, and then let me give you the actual specific explanation. The analogy I would make is the transition in private securities from um, the way they exist now on paper to digitize on the blockchain is like the uh, movement in written communication from snail mail to email. Content of the written communication is the same, still written in the language of choice. But once you digitize it, it's faster, cheaper, and easier by orders of magnitude to send it and you can do amazing things with it. So you think of, it used to be we typed out a letter, we clicked print, we put an envelope, paid 50 cents, waited three days, that seemed fine. Then we click send, and you send an email, all you need is an address, and it's faster, cheaper, and easier by orders of magnitude. It'll be a similar effect on private capital formation. The reason why you need a blockchain is the same reason why you needed open internet standards for email to take off. You had, there were email systems that uh, companies had just internal to them that campuses had. I can remember when I was an undergrad, um, we had, it was called Blitzmail. You could only email people on campus, so no one ever used it. And then I distinctly remember the moment in the mid-90s, that transition from clicking print for, to clicking send, that transition where no matter where your friends were around the world, you could communicate with each other electronically, orders of magnitude faster, cheaper, and easier. And it was because of open internet standards where you could have Gmail, talk to Yahoo, talk to Outlook, talk to whatever. If that was all one centralized database, it never would have taken off. And when you look at the capital markets, there are way too many functions for one centralized entity to be able to do it. So in a future world in which we've tokenized private securities and they're trading, there are a number of different functions. There's an exchange function or trade execution. There's um, market making functions or people providing liquidity. There are um, issuing platforms, think of it the technical equivalent to an investment bank, raising capital. There are um, qualified custodians. Um, if you think there are transfer agents, if you think of all those functions, all of those are a distinct tech stack. There's a whole bunch of tech you gotta develop. There's a distinct regulatory stack. Those are all highly regulated. Most require licensure and ongoing reporting. That's not trivial. And they all have a different business stack, a different set of business processes and relationships, which if you combine them all into one, become competitive with each other, and that you then have to duplicate jurisdiction by jurisdiction. In a blockchain world, i.e. an open internet standard, in which you can exchange value or trade that security token, um, you can get in a world in which all these different players can interoperate, like common internet standards or common email standards, and it's a world in which you can trade that value, that tokenized security, 24-7, 365, around the globe with near instantaneous settlement, no counterparty risk, and potentially one wide uh, pool of liquidity. You cannot do that on a practicable level in a centralized solution. I need to jump in here because a few things were just said that are just plain not true today. And I think will probably unlikely be true this is in getting the next good. 10 years. Um, <laughs> If you want a fast, cheap, and easy solution, for the love of God, use a Google Sheet. Do not use a blockchain. 
Now, I want to I wanna preface this with, I do think that there are some interesting things about this idea of security tokens that will come to fruition eventually. But to say that it's better in those ways than using Excel or Google Sheets or you know whatever sort of cloud cap table management solutions we have today, that is just not true. You cannot do that on Ethereum. So that's wrong. So <laughs> the point, this is awesome. The point there is not the maintenance of the cap table on the Google Sheet. The point there is the trading of that value. What it is is with a blockchain, you have the ability of two counterparties to trade. In essence, you can program how they trade and they're writing to a shared Google spreadsheet together. There is no way in which you digitize private security, shares in a private REIT, LP interest in a fund. You need to have some way for them to exchange that value, for me to trade my LP interest to you in exchange for value back, according with the rules around that private cap table enforced and the ability to do that with all these different players. There are people who have tried it before and it's never worked well. So there's give a me few a second. things so that are not technology second, issues. What do you think? You've been doing a lot of research in this space. Sure. So, um, I mean, I guess if we, you know, because this question is often asked around security tokens, you know, why do we need a blockchain? Why can't we just do this with, with centralized databases? And I think if you, if you take it up to sort of a, a 50,000 foot view, you know, the idea is like we, we have databases, we've had databases for years, for decades actually. Um, and yet we don't have all these things we're talking about that, that we're hoping are possible with security tokens. And so then you have to step back and you have to ask, why is that the case? We, we have A and we don't have B. Um, why is that? Well, maybe it's because um, these things just aren't things that, that the world wants, but I actually you know, strongly disagree with that. I think the idea of integrated global peer-to-peer -peer capital markets um, is really powerful and definitely something that the world wants. And so if you say, all right, this is something the world wants and we have all these tools, yet we don't have the things that we're hoping for, then you, there must be some frictions, right? And so stepping into sort of like, what are those frictions? This is the interesting part. Um, I think those frictions are not entirely technological. There are definitely a lot of regulatory frictions, uh, but that doesn't mean technology can't help us with those as well. And so that's why I think, you know, projects like Harbor are important. And as a, for full disclosure, I'm an advisor to Harbor. Um, but I think that, you know, these compliance solutions are important because a lot of the friction is around, uh, is around regulations. So that is not purely a um, database versus uh, blockchain situation. But I think that the point Josh made that it's very hard to get uh, all the market participants that you need to build on top of a centralized solution where the value accrues to, to one group or one company, it's much easier um, to solicit that type of development on more of an open standard uh, is one of the keys to, to blockchain. Yeah, and one other, I think, let's step back for a moment and ask ourselves, why aren't private securities liquid today? Why, I mean, why aren't they liquid? Liquidity is not a technology an issue. If it, I could point for a moment to 0x, which I'm a huge fan of the project, They've done so many things right on the technology level, and liquidity remains a huge issue in that market. So, what I'm talking about, as it does every cryptocurrency. Private securities, is. an LP interest in a fund or a share in a private REIT, why are they liquid today? Well, there are I, two big issues there, I think. There, one, okay. is in, one is information. So, yeah. y it's not enough that you can technically trade a security, you need to be able to price it to have a liquid market, mm -hmm. right? I think the other, when you look at private securities, is um, around control. So if you look, for example, in the startup equity space, right, mm -hmm. you're seeing companies go exactly the other way, right? They want more and more and more control because they saw the shit show that was sort of the Facebook era, companies staying late longer, yeah. private trading, and they said, we need control of that, right? So you need parties that want the securities to trade, right? Mm -hmm. And you need enough information that people can trade them. I think the other point I would add in terms of how you get this global frictionless thing is, you need the ability to legally trade. And I think the real problem there is no one wants another Osama bin Laden. So you have governments saying, hey, look, man, you just can't trade these things anonymously in your underwear. Yeah, in so, your okay, so bedroom. wrong mental model. So we're focusing on sort of analogs to a lot of the protocol tokens or crypto native stuff that we're thinking. Talk about traditional private finance. People today are raising capital to go um, buy apartment buildings, they're raising private equity funds, they're raising others. 
um, private capital formation exceeds the public markets in the US, in Europe, in Asia, around the world. And the reason why is because the expense and delay and ongoing regulatory brain damage in the public markets is so high. Those public markets have almost no liquidity. There are, I guarantee you today, private wealth managers at Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan in San Francisco and New York who haven't gotten their clients into these highly liquid investments, now have to get them out. It takes months, sometimes years. It takes a lot of elbow grease because there's only a limited number of counterparty, potential counterparties they know about. It takes you 10, even once you find a buyer, it takes you 10 to 20 grand in a couple weeks of trading docs to lawyer it up. And then worst of all, you take a big hit on the valuation, the illiquidity discount. A figure you hear a lot in the academic literature is 30%. If you talk to people in the fund space, or the private read space, the figures I hear are 40 to 60%. The reason why you have those problems is threefold. To Parker's point, buyer and seller can't find each other. Second, you gotta repaper every transaction in the most expensive and annoying way possible, i.e. you gotta individually lawyer it. And third, and most importantly, in the private security space, there's a whole bunch of complex compliance rules that in a paper world, you have to go through the fund manager in order to control. So for example, a private read has to have a minimum of 100 investors or it blows its tax treatment, maximum 2,000 or it's gotta go public, non-US persons have to own less than 50%, and top five shareholders have to own less than 50%, or it blows its tax treatment, et cetera. There's a whole, and no matter what type of private security is, there's all these complicated rules. So you, you need to centralize that compliance. In a tokenized world, when you tokenize these traditional securities, you start to attack all three problems. The technology does not provide liquidity, it's neither a buyer nor a seller, but the technology removes a lot of the friction to enable liquidity because there's latent desire for liquidity there. Tokenization allows buyer and seller to find each other. Exchanges are springing up, bulletin boards, OTC desks. It allows you, if you set up the corporate documents correctly, you do not need to repaper the transaction. The transfer to the security token does everything you need to do from a legal standpoint. So weeks and 20 grand goes to a $100 exchange fee and 15 minute block writing time. And then finally and most importantly, you can lower that illiquidity discount. In a world in which buyer and seller can find each other and quickly and uh, efficiently transact, that illiquidity discount doesn't go away. If you want the liquidity of the public markets, you have to go public. But the illiquidity discount may go from 50% to, I don't know, 25%. That alone is a tremendous amount of value. I mean, Parker, are you buying the idea that REITs can be better uh, with, with blockchain in that case? Look, and the, I, the liquidity is still going to be an issue. Yeah, look, you know, a $20 million house on a blockchain does not have more liquidity than before. I mean, the fact that there's no buyer and sell is still going to be an issue. Can I offer a framework to yeah. think about this issue? Go so. Ahead. Every trade has three stages of it, or three layers of the stack, you can think of it. At the top of the stack of a trade, there's the execution step, and that's price discovery. That's where buyer and seller have to meet and agree on a price. The second layer of the stack is the clearing step, and that's where all kinds of details of the transaction get exchanged. That's where a lot of the regulatory stuff that you mentioned happens. And then finally, there's the actual settlement of the trade. So previously, when I was talking about the trucks running around lower Manhattan delivering these physical stock certificates, that settlement, when I was talking about the DTCC or when you were talking about the Excel spreadsheets, that's all settlement. Blockchain is fundamentally a settlement technology. If you think about the execution layer for any cryptocurrency product, it's still happening in a somewhat centralized way, whether that's through radar relay, whether that's through local bitcoins, whether that's through Coinbase. And so I would just encourage us all to think about where does the issue of liquidity lie in that stack? I would argue, and based on my own experience, the issue of liquidity primarily lies at the execution level, not at the settlement level. Yeah, and I think the way that I would look at this is like, I just did a real estate investment, a multifamily property kind of in the range that Harbor is doing, maybe a little bit smaller. And you know, the real problems that I have making that investment are, well, who is this person doing this development that's actually creating this value? Why should I trust them? Um, getting them the money, signing the docs, these are not the problems. And then if you look at their side, it's, hey, look, I've got this 
$15 million project, how do I find someone like Parker, right? So what's the cost of marketing these things? So minimally, I think, when you look at um, securitizing these assets, you've got to ask yourself, you know, what's subscale, right? Is my house subscale? Like, what does it cost me if I've got a million dollar house? What does it cost me to securitize that thing? Okay, first I've got to put it in an LLC and maintain that LLC, and if I'm gonna sell you a piece of it, I've got to then go buy insurance because you don't want me living in this thing where someone falls and you lose your investment, that you've got to trust that I'm competent. There's all of these problems that probably make much of this private market subscale, not all of it, right? Um, but I think that you've got to figure out what are those thresholds and what's cost effective to do, because in many cases, I think you find even a 20% um, liquidity premium isn't just going to cover the fixed cost of um, constructing these vehicles and marketing them and dealing with all the compliance. Yeah, I, you need a minimum deal size. I think it's unclear and you'll get more efficiencies over time, but I think less than 25 million, it's really tough to find enough value to get there. Um, the, but it exists today, and I, you know, it was interesting, our thesis originally would be the lower end of the market that's really interested in liquidity, so if you talk to, like, the real estate crowdfunding sites, they'll talk a lot about their investors wanting liquidity, both to get into, uh, to double down or to increase their investment in existing investments, as well as to exit or rebalance amongst the various investments, um, and it's very difficult for them to do today. But what's interesting is even talking to people as big as pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, they're looking for more liquidity or ability to get in and out, and they're looking for those investments to be in, still keeping the same check size for the initial investment, but for smaller chunks um, to unbundle into smaller units that they can then trade in and out of. Um, and I think you get into very interesting areas. So Jill's point is correct on that execution later or price discovery. Tokenization itself doesn't give you that, but it gives you a digital format, an open standard on which everyone can build where you can create venues where you can get more efficient um, uh, identification, discovery of opportunities and price. And again, the public markets are the wrong comparison. It's never going to be that. The comparison is to a world in which it takes months or years today. I have talked to private wealth managers where literally, sometimes again, LP out takes them years. A world in which it's $20,000 of repapering it to trade that LP unit. In a world in which if that LP unit's worth 200 grand, that's a prohibitive hit on returns. So a world in which months or years takes days to weeks in which 20 grand and two weeks of lawyering takes 200 bucks and 15 minutes and where the illiquidity discount goes from 50% to 30% or 25% is not the world of the public markets, but it's a far better world than you have today. And then you get some really interesting secondary effects where with some of these other technologies like DYDX, the ability to do efficient levered longs and levered shorts, the ability with MakerDAO to um, do efficient margin loans in a stable coin, and some of these other technologies, you can do really interesting things that add additional value. All of these are doable in paper today, but they're not practicable from a logistics standpoint. In the same way in which, in a world of um, written communication that was on paper, you just, on a practical level, you didn't do things. At today, every day, I send an email asking where are we going to lunch today, and no one ever mailed that letter before. Can someone unpack for me how Having this new tokenized format, which is fundamentally about the settlement layer, helps with price discovery, which is about the execution layer. I'm, I, I'm genuinely curious. Yeah, so I think because you're going to start to see exchanges spring up where people are listing these. Um, and right now in a paper world, um, because of those complicated cap table management uh, requirements, those private screws almost always, on a almost always have a prohibition on the transfer of it. You could just, even if you find a buyer, you can't sell it to them. You gotta go to that fund manager, you gotta go to that REIT manager, because they have to maintain min-max investor numbers, they gotta maintain all these specialized rules that they can only do by centralizing the trade through But that. how is the token gonna make what? a difference? Well, how is the token gonna make a difference in the because you have regulations to this? It's because still... you can control it algorithmically, well, it's you can control it programmatically. It solves a technical problem, but it doesn't solve the discovery problem, it doesn't solve the information flow it problem. It allows you to attack the discovery problem by aggregating a large number of these that are digitized in one place. So that's like saying that electronic exchanges, New York Stock Exchange and stuff, um, did not solve uh, the problems. They just provided well, but, a venue. But the New York Stock Exchange occur. is the execution level. The DTCC is the settlement level. And the DTCC is what's still broken. Well, and I think the difference between the public markets and the private right. markets is you have this compliance layer where um, you have the SEC there to make sure that 
investors have um, somewhat complete and equivalent information, right? Like you have a lot of mm. problems solved at the cost of high overhead, right? Like those things just don't make sense to apply to these private transactions. So, so the New York Stock Exchange provides liquidity fundamentally because it provides a venue for buyer and seller to buy and it aggregates liquidity in one place. And trust. By digitizing these, it allows you, because you're going to get a long tail of these, I think these trade like the microcap stocks, the old NASDAQ pink sheets, for those who used to get a newspaper. Um, by have, imagine the NASDAQ pink sheets, only anyone around the world could press on the piece of paper and trade. Liquidity gets incrementally better, not magically better, incrementally better. In a world in which you can aggregate a lot of these that have a long tail, that trade like microcap stocks, that you can put them in centralized venues um, that... Uh, that exist and that you can use technologies like 0x, that you can share one worldwide pool of liquidity. Imagine a world in which you've got a compliantly licensed exchange in Singapore with relationships with Singapore investors and market makers and others. And the same thing with one in the US, both operating on a 0x protocol, they can share one order book. You can have a buyer in Singapore for an LP interest in a real estate private equity fund, a seller in the US, and that trade can cross. Again, not the public markets, but far better than today. Because today, in this paper world, even if you provided an electronic pace where people could post it up, they got to find somebody. Then they got to exchange red lines of documents back and forth for two weeks. They got to spend 20 grand. And they got to ask permission from the fund manager, who then's got to go get copies of the paper docs and then vet the buyer. That's a world in which the friction to doing it is too high to allow it. That sounds like a digitization problem for me. But do you have anything to add before we move I on to the next? I would just add that. Um, you know, one of the keys here is standardizing ownership claims, and it was very powerful. We saw in 2017, you know, with the ICO boom, you know, a lot of that was predicated on a standard, on ERC-20, right? So the, you know, 84, 85% of, of those tokens were on ERC-20 standard, and that's part of the, the situation here with security tokens, is right, by standardizing these ownership claims, the idea is that uh, you're going to be able to uh, bring more buyers and sellers to these venues, and yes, some of the buyers and sellers, or some of the venues are definitely centralized. If you looked at many of the security token exchanges, there's decentralized versions. There's also uh, centralized versions. So this is definitely uh, distinct from a lot of, um, I guess, other forms of trading in the sense that this they're definitely centralized components. But the key here to realize about liquidity is that you know, when we measure liquidity, it's a continuum, right? So we, I don't usually think of things as liquid or illiquid. I think about the cost to trade. Like that's how academics measure liquidity, right? Like how wide is the bid-ask spread? Um, how much is the price impact for a, a trade of a given size? That's sort of how we think about it. And it all ties back largely to market depth. So by standardizing ownership claims, to the degree that you can increase the depth of market for some of these assets. And yes, definitely the, 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 the gain in the market depth might be incremental, um, but it is, gonna, it is gonna move us along this continuum of um, liquidity with the idea that it is potentially still gonna be costly to move in and out, but less costly than it was before. And so I guess to me, all of this traces back to this idea of market depth and how can we integrate markets and pool liquidity uh, and this seems like a route to achieve that. Thank you. Um, okay, let's cool off things a little bit. Um, let's talk about the future. You know, so you're a little bearish about this, Jill. What is the one use case that you're actually very excited about security tokens? I'm actually not bearish about security tokens. I am a realist about security tokens, I think. Um, you know, coming from my background, which was I was the junior kid on a trading desk for a few years on Wall Street. What that meant in practice was that frequently I was the one booking the trades and then dealing with all of the broken back office systems. I would stay there for hours after work on the phone with the people in our middle and back office who were the ones reconciling all of the trades, making sure that the books looked right versus all of our counterparties versus this big, ugly institution I keep mentioning called the DTCC. And I can tell you that there's a lot about this central database model that Wall Street uses that is very broken, that to me, it's exciting to think about a world in which we do have a different settlement 
format. I don't think this is going to fix liquidity. I don't think that this is going to be some fancy regulatory arbitrage. As we learned in 2017, that only works for so long. Um, but I do think that the idea of having a new settlement rail for all types of assets, including securities, is interesting. Anybody else wants to, besides you, Josh, we know you're bullish. <laughs> Parker, anything else that excites you about it? Um, yeah, look, I think some of this stuff can work, right? Like, I think what Harbor is doing is interesting. I think when you look at um, solving some of the compliance problems, there's potentially money to be saved there. And at the end of the day, like, these things have to have a real impact. I'm less bullish on solving some of these other problems, but both because I think the market wants different things, at least segments of it. Um, but if you look at real estate, for example, that it seems like large real estate projects might want more liquidity and might be really um, uh, lend themselves towards securitization because you just don't need very much information. And the larger the project, the easier it is to understand. So it seems that liquidity should follow from that. So I think those are the areas where I would expect if we sort of zoom forward and do the, you know, the Harbor IPO roadshow, right? It's working um, for this use case. Um, and I'm much less interested personally in sort of the, you know, I don't think we're gonna disrupt uh, Carta with blockchain. I just don't think that makes any sense. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how real estate goes and then maybe we'll take over the world from there. So. I I guess uh, I'll add on uh, what I'm excited about, and we'll let you finish up. Um, that was what you're not excited about. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I am excited about is, as I said before, this idea of, of globally integrated peer-to-peer -peer capital markets is a very powerful one. Now, how we get there is, uh, is going to be a challenging path, but I do think that programmable securities are, are a key piece. And the reason why is that, you know, I've spent some time talking to regulators, regulators from all over the world, about this and, and harmonizing the laws, like that's not happening anytime soon, right? I mean, what even what, def, what is a security can, is not the same from country to country to country, right? And so the idea is that you've got to have a layer that can sit on top of this patchwork of sort of jurisdictional, you know, regulatory differences that can, you know, sort of a passportable investor identity is probably important. You know, being able to, you know, program into the security the laws of all the various jurisdictions, those are the types of things that we need to actually achieve this idea um, of integrated markets. And so those are the things I'm excited about. You want to add, Josh? Sure. <laughs> so um, I think what becomes interesting is a world in which you start to tokenize a significant number of assets. You get that critical mass of both uh, investors and other market participants and assets, the second order effects of what you can do. So. A lot of what's in the pipeline for us are um, single properties or small baskets of properties that allow people to make an investment um, in lower check size with some potential liquidity on the back end. Um, not the public markets, not the bond desk, but better than what they have today. Um, what I think becomes really interesting is a world in which you start to tokenize more and more of those, because those will trade thinly. Those are going to be $15,000 to $50,000 a tokenized share. They're going to trade like microcap stocks. Um, but then imagine a world in which you've tokenized a bunch of the Class A office buildings around the New York metropolitan area. The, again, those will trade thinly. But you set technology or use a fund and you buy up 10% of the shares of the Class A in downtown. You now have a downtown Class A ETF. That will trade more often because the due diligence or information requirements for each individual asset is much lower. It's much more about the thesis of how that neighborhood's going to do. You can do the same for Midtown, for Uptown, for Brooklyn, for Jersey. Using DYDX, you can go long downtown, you can go short Midtown. You can do a development in one area and hedge your exposure or double down on your exposure. You go long Manhattan, short the boroughs, long New York, short San Francisco. You can efficiently take margin loans on that using MakerDAO. You can use SET to create custom ETFs on the fly. It's a world in which you can do really interesting things and I think the depth of the market, the depth of the liquidity increases as you go up those levels of abstraction because to Parker's point, the informational requirements about the specific asset become less. It becomes much more about bets on macro trends or large investment theses, but all of these become very interesting. And it's not just the financial types um, whose eyes light up at these opportunities for arbitrage. It's also some interesting innovative products that affect average Americans. 
People are not gonna tokenize a house. They're not gonna tokenize a $100,000, $200,000 asset. The friction will never be low enough for that to make sense. What becomes interesting though is, is most Americans have the vast majority of their retirement wealth tied up in the value of their home. And they have no efficient way to hedge that. Imagine a world in which those hedge funds or places like Invitation Homes that have huge baskets of residential real estate tokenize batches of 100 or 200 homes. You literally have something that shows you the value at a neighborhood level of residential real estate. You can then aggregate that into funds that are the far eastern suburbs of the Bay Area, the inner eastern suburbs, Marin or what have you. An insurance company could offer insurance on the value of people's home and it could efficiently lay off its risk. And so if someone's home, for example, fell below a certain value for a certain period of time, it pays off a certain amount and people could effectively hedge their exposure. Or I rent in the Bay Area because I can't afford to buy. I would have loved to have bought a piece of something that tracked residential housing because that would have hedged my exposure as a renter as my rents have escalated astronomically. So it opens up a lot of innovative financial products for real world consumers. Anybody else wants to add anything? Are we good? Yeah, go ahead. We only have a couple of minutes left here, I know, but I would just say, let's not, and this is for everyone, the audience, everyone who's watching, please, as an industry, let's not confuse financial engineering with the technology. What's possible with financial engineering has been possible for decades. It was a part of what got us into the mess of 2008, out of which Bitcoin was born, which is both a financial tool and a technology. But let's not just think that because this technology can enable us to create programmed assets, that we're doing something new. There's nothing new under the sun in terms of financial engineering. I would agree with that, but I do think that, that uh, technology can make some of these things a lot more feasible. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think as we look at this stuff, a, a common conversation in crypto is like, look, is the technology going to disrupt the regulation or is the regulation going to neuter the technology? It's not obvious, right? Um, but, you know, I'm old enough to remember when mobile came along and everybody said, we're going to build a mobile X for millennials, right? And just none of it worked because none of it mattered, right? That wasn't what mobile was good for. Um, and then somebody built Uber, which is, you're kind of like, well, that's the obvious thing. And I, I think the, you know, the relative bear case that I have here is I look at the technology, right, this distributed um, ledger, you start looking at what matters about it, and then you map it to the use cases we're talking about. And it's just not obvious that that's, it, it, might, it might work. We might be able to use this database and these smart contracts that are neither smart nor contracts to enforce some rules on this thing, like you can do it, but is that really the thing that is Uber, or are we building, a, you know, whatever mobile insurance for millennials uh, and trying to make that work? You have 30 seconds. Got it. What you do with the English language in a written letter or an email is no different. The language is what it is. But the technology matters in what you can do with the communications, and that's the difference, I think, when you tokenize private securities. Yeah, this is all, all staged, you know, we're actually all very bullish about security tokens. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming, really appreciate it, it was thank awesome. Uh, we'll have some videos later. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.